The Nintendo DS was such an influential console. From the moment it was announced, gamers all over the world lined their pants with brown streaks in anticipation of what was to come. Coming from the Game Boy Advance, having two screens was super revolutionary, especially since one of them was a touchscreen. Some of the promotional material for the DS was super suggestive, which was weird, and not something I'd see Nintendo doing now, that's for sure. But it damn sure got the message across to Nintendo fans all over the world speculating the future of this new device. Now I'm not here today to talk about the games that everyone knows about on the Nintendo DS, such as Mario Party or New Super Mario Bros. I mean, the title of the video is the best Nintendo DS game you've never played, not the best DS game you have played. If I wanted to talk about games you've already played, I'd have done that already, but regardless, I'm here to talk about Transformers Decepticons for the Nintendo DS. I've spoken about this game on the channel before, and I actually hold the speedrun world record for the alternate game in the series, Autobots, but that's only because there wasn't a world record record holder to begin with, and it was super easy, like taking candy from a child at the park, but without the lawsuit and potential beatdown from the father afterwards. I know that a lot of people will probably feel like clicking off of the video because of the Transformers title, but I implore you to stay and hear me out. The game has one of the most compelling storylines in all of DS game history, or at least out of all the DS games I've played in my lifetime, and it flies under almost everyone's radar without a trace. It does so many new things that I've never seen in a DS game before, such as having six playable characters all with unique weapons, stats, and playstyles, four fully open world locations for you to explore, an intricate wanted level system, and all of this for a movie based game. I'm going to talk mostly about the story before I talk too much about the gameplay because that's where we're going to dive into the mechanics of the game and all the glitches etc etc. Something cool to note about this game before I start on the story and whatnot is that the voice actor for Barricade, Keith David, voiced Spawn in Mortal Kombat 11, your custom character in the game or creator bot as he's noted in the credits, is also voiced by Steve Blum, who voiced Sub-Zero in Mortal Kombat 11. I only learned this recently, but it was really cool to boot up MK and hear the interactions between the two characters with this game as a sort of pre-context. Knowing the relationship between your custom character and Barricade in this game, it was really nice to hear the two voices interact together again. The story starts out with a pre-rendered cutscene, with Starscream narrating over the top like he's in some sort of intergalactic nature documentary. They use a clip from the movie in this scene, and it actually looks pretty good for the DS downscaling. The actual game begins with your custom character crash landing on Earth in Cybertronian form. You need to suspend your disbelief here because you crash land on the sidewalk of the Vegas Casino Strip. This apparently attracts no attention from anyone in the area or anyone inside any of the buildings nearby, which is odd considering how populated the Casino Strip is. Did you kill the entire population of Las Vegas upon impact? The game hasn't even started yet and you're already complicit in a mass homicide. How fantastic. Anyways, Starscream, the current leader of the Decepticons in Megatron's absence, tells you that he's received a faint Decepticon signal from Earth, and that's why you're all here. He sets up a cute date between you and fellow comrade Barricade, who by the way is going to end up being the best written character in the game. You spend the next 5 minutes in a tutorial stage, where you're taught how to throw punches and fire your weapons. When I say you're in a tutorial stage, I mean you're kinda told to do the tutorial in the space you're given. The whole game is free roam, meaning levels all take place in one of four locations, depending on where the story takes you. At this point in the game, you're in the casino strip location, so you can run around and do whatever you want, without progressing the story if that's really your thing, but for the most part that'll get boring after a while and there's only so many family SUVs you can fucking obliterate before that becomes a chore too. Anyway, Barricade tells you to meet up with him in the fictional city of Tranquility. Once you get there, he tells you to blow up some cars parked in a Walmart parking lot, and evidently this attracts the city's police force to come and investigate. This isn't just for the mission either, this is an actual game mechanic they implemented from the high-end Xbox and PS3 ports of the games. Those games have an intricate wanted level system similar to GTA or other large open world games. And here they have a similar system. I'm going to quickly explain how the wanted levels in this game work because they have significant impact on the game later on. Minor damage to the environment will get you a 1 star wanted level. Damage some more property or drive headfirst into trees, yes this is something that you can do for some reason, and your wanted level will rise to 2 stars. 1 and 2 star wanted levels are super easy to avoid. All you have to do is sit in your vehicle form so that no one notices a giant robot walking around the streets and you'll be fine. Wait for the stars to drop and boom, you're good. Once you get to 3 or 4 stars, things start to get a little tricky. At this point the cops 
cops know your vehicle form so they'll know who you are even if you're hiding in your truck mode in some shady back alley somewhere. So to escape the cops at this point you actually have a few options. Option A, you can just engage in a cop chase and drive around the city until your threat level drops back down to zero. This can also be achieved by hiding. The more fun option, option B, is to smash the shit out of everything in your way and completely wipe out the city's police force. The game has four wanted levels, so upping yourself to a five star neutralizes it entirely, forcing the rest of the police to retreat. It's a really cool feature that they definitely didn't have to include, and I'm still kind of surprised that they included such a deep wanted level system in a DS game to begin with, but I'm definitely not complaining in the slightest. It's a lot of fun to blast the fuck out of the cops, and it's definitely the most fun thing to do post-game. It's especially fun to do in the Autobots version where you're supposed to be the heroes defending the city, stomping on everything and burning buildings down. I'm getting distracted, let's continue on with the story. Anyway, after forcing you to wreck more cars and dodge your first batch of cops, Barricade explains to you that you're not just tracking down any Decepticon signal, you've all been sent here because the signal came from Megatron. Just tell me if you found the source of the Decepticon signal. We aren't tracking down just any Decepticon, punk. The signal came from Megatron himself. Megatron? All this for him? He's a joke. He abandoned us ages ago. Watch your mouth. Without Megatron, you'd just be another Autobot blindly following Optimus Prime and the rest of his weaklings. Now get lost. And think about that. Barricade tells you that he's tracked an Autobot to a nearby location who he suspects has information on Megatron's whereabouts. Once you go there and kill him, you find out that Bumblebee, an Autobot scout, is investigating a lead about a human ship from a hundred years ago. The captain supposedly saw a giant metal man frozen in the ice cap, which you and Barricade suspect to be Megatron's corpse. Barricade realizes that the Autobots are trying to race them to find Megatron so they can destroy him for good, so he tells you to stay where you are while he goes off to stop Bumblebee. It's at this point in the story where your character starts to get kinda shady. You jump on an alien zoom call with Starscream and you tell him everything you've just learned. Lord Starscream, I've rendezvoused with Barricade, but he isn't being very forthcoming. I should have foreseen this. I apologize. Barricade is suspicious of everyone. He will need to find a way to earn his trust. Did you find out anything? The Autobot Bumblebee seems interested in a ship's captain who may have seen me- um... The Decepticon, who sent the signal we received. How interesting. Did you find out where this captain saw the Metal Man? In the southern polar region of the planet. The natives refer to it as Antarctica. Do you want us to go there to investigate? That won't be necessary. I wouldn't want either of you to waste the energy to chase after ghosts. Keep me posted on any new developments. Starscream out. Ghosts, eh, Starscream? <laughs> we'll see about that. The next mission has you killing cops and innocent people to create a diversion so that Barricade can hunt Bumblebee in peace. It's a fun mission, but there's not much to it. You blow up cars, kill some cops, have a lot of fun, moving on. The next mission is the first true boss fight of the game. You now take control of Barricade and engage in a high-speed cop chase with Bumblebee. This is probably one of my favorite boss fights in the game, mostly because of how much you can do with it. The level starts off with you chasing him down to a predetermined location, where you both then transform and fight it out for a few minutes before he runs away again and you've got to keep following him. This happens twice more with the third fist fight being the last of the level. The most fun part about this stage, however, is probably memorizing the routes Bumblebee takes and racing him to them. By default, even without using your turbo boost ability, Barricade has a higher speed stat than Bumblebee does. For someone fresh to the game, you're not going to know where he's going, so this doesn't matter too much as you're going to have to force yourself to stay behind him so you know which way to go and you don't end up getting outrun. However, once you've memorized the routes he takes, you can just drive straight past him him and go to the predetermined fight locations in order. This is a great speedrunning strat since if you get to the location before him, you can transform early and pelt him with missiles while he's still defenseless in his vehicle mode. This will give you an edge in the hand-to-hand -hand combat sections as the duration of these are dependent on his health meter. Once he reaches a certain amount of health, he'll run away so getting that edge can help with that. Absolutely nothing I just said matters anyways because this boss isn't exactly super hard or anything, it's just fun to figure out and implement strategies. Anyway, you hunt down Bumblebee you beat the crap out of him, steal his information, and he runs away. Find anything? Yeah, I did. Looks like the Autobots found the source of the signal. They've got a team in Antarctica right now that reported Megatron was imprisoned there, but was moved to an unknown location. Something to do with some human military organization called Sector 7. 
Do the Autobots know where Sector 7 moved Megatron to? No, but they retrieved an encrypted file called Project Iceman that they think has the info. We need to get our own copy of that file. Hmm. Looks like we could get it from a human military server. The humans have a military operation going on on the other side of the planet. Probably our best shot at getting easy access to their network. I'll have Blackout take you there, and Brawl will rendezvous with you. So Blackout takes you to Quatar Desert where you meet Brawl. The three of you plan to break into the nearby military base and retrieve a copy of the file Barricade spoke of, Project Iceman. You have a few missions here at the military base, but there are some flaws with them. While you're here, you can scan a helicopter as your own character so that you can fly into the base and cause a distraction, blow up some tanks, and finally take control of Blackout as you scan the Iceman file. It sounds like it would make for a cool three-man infiltration spy type set of missions, and to an extent that is what it is. The mission where you play as brawl and blow the fuck out of some tanks is perfectly fine, it's just what it says on the tin, nothing more satisfying than blowing stuff up in a game where you exclusively play as the bad guys. But the issue lies in the mission with Blackout. The mission is okay, and for the most part fairly simple, however while scanning the files the game requires you to stand perfectly still. Any missiles that hit you and knock you on your ass will take you out of the scanning mode and reset the scan progress. It's annoying. Other than that, it's fine, and these missions aren't half bad. Once you're done scanning the files and ready to head back to Tranquility, Ratchet shows up out of nowhere for a surprise boss fight. This is a weird boss fight and probably the worst in the entire game. He's super easy to beat and only takes a few shots to the face before running away. This boss fight is especially easy once you return to it after you've beaten the game with your max level character. One missile to the face and he's fucking dead. It's super satisfying to flatten him, but it begs the question as to why they made his health meters so low. I guess because he's a medic? I think I'm looking too deep into this, let's move on. Once Ratchet leaves, you open up another alien zoom call with Starscream and you tell him you just retrieved the file. Excited to hear the news, he opens up to you about his own secret plans. Starscream, come in. Report. A human military organization called Sector 7 has the Decepticon in prison, but we don't know their location. We've recovered an encrypted file called Project Iceman that should tell us where. Excellent. Let me know the moment you find the Sector 7 coordinates. Lord Starscream, can't you tell me more about our real mission? All we've learned is that a Decepticon crashed here ages ago. I have reason to believe that the signal came from my predecessor, Megatron. What does that matter? You told me that Megatron abandoned us. True, but I never revealed to anyone why Megatron left us. Are you familiar with the Cybertronian relic, the Allspark? The Allspark? You mean it's not just a myth? No, it is quite real, and with power beyond your comprehension. It was within our grasp, but the Autobots launched it into deep space. Megatron went after the Allspark. Never to be heard from again until now. If, if Megatron came to Earth, then the Allspark may be here as well. So why not tell the others of this? If the others were to learn of the Allspark's presence, they would all fight to recover it for themselves. I only wish to retrieve it so that I may maintain order. I know you can be trusted with this information. For the good of all Decepticons, you must help me to recover the Allspark. I understand, Lord Starscream. Following this, you take Brawl and Blackout back to Tranquility where Barricade awaits your return. A few missions follow this that have you blowing up Sector 7 and police vehicles that are hunting you down after your attack on the Quatar military base. The whole premise here is that you're giving Barricade time to crack the file you scanned that contains Megatron's whereabouts but it's just a shitload of fun to blow everyone up without any regard as to why you're doing it. I think another reason this version of the game is superior to the Autobot counterpart is mostly due to the fact that it makes more sense to be having fun blowing up the city as a bad guy than it does as Optimus Prime or Bumblebee. It's exactly the same in the other game, it just doesn't feel right. It's like if they made an Avengers game where the only thing to do in Free Roam was to visit hospitals, but instead of being part of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, the Avengers commit arson on every hospital in the fucking state. It makes sense if you were playing Doctor Doom or Thanos or something, but Iron Man throttling people on the street just doesn't sit right. Although saying that, I'm still mad they don't let you throw people in front of trucks or toss people off buildings in the Spider-Man PS4 game. Although I guess by saying that, I'm just disproving my own point. L let's just move on. Once you're done with these missions, blowing up the police forces, Blackout tells you that he's intercepted an Autobot transmission that claims Optimus Prime is on his way to Earth. 
I'm afraid I have more bad news. I've intercepted a transmission that mentions Autobot reinforcements entering the atmosphere, and that Optimus Prime is with them. After this, there's a mission where you get to go around killing the other Autobots that arrived on Earth alongside Optimus Prime, but you don't actually fight Optimus himself. It's a lot of fun and it's nice to see the human forces actually shoot the Autobots alongside yourself. If you stand far back enough from the Autobots, you can actually just let the humans take them out and you don't have to get involved at all to pass the stage. This mission concludes with you crossing paths with Bumblebee, who's being chased down by the Sector 7 trucks. You shoot a fleeing Bumblebee off of a rooftop where he's quickly captured by the human forces. You return to Barricade to break the news of Bumblebee's capture and he follows up with a pretty cool speech. Sector 7 captured Bumblebee. The Autobots have been trying to help the humans. Why would the humans want to imprison a potential ally? Because they're weak. Weakness breeds fear. And fear makes every ally an enemy. That's why we Decepticons don't tolerate weakness. If you'd been trained properly by someone like Megatron instead of that weasel Starscream, you might understand that. Were you able to decipher the file? Yeah. The Iceman is located at the Sector 7 headquarters in a place called Hoover Dam. It's two mega miles east of here. Starscream will want to know about this information. Starscream can blow it out his exhaust! Once we revive Megatron, we won't need to worry about Starscream anymore. What makes you think Megatron is so much better a ruler than Starscream? Because you know where you stand with Megatron. Starscream is the type that would kill you in your sleep. Megatron would have the ball bearings to do it to your face. Now let's move out. So you figure out Megatron is being held at a secret base underneath the Hoover Dam in Nevada. You and your team travel there and make individual plans about how to proceed with saving Megatron going forwards. Barricade says he and Blackout will keep an eye on the perimeter while Brawl takes out the communication systems. You're told to stay put until further notice, so you use this opportune time to fill Starscream in on the information that you as a group have learned. Starscream, come in. Report. We're at the Sector 7 headquarters located at Hoover Dam. We're currently trying to find a way into the base. Do any of the others suspect that our true goal is the Allspark? Not yet, but it will come out soon. Assuming you are correct. Listen to me very carefully. If Megatron is revived, he will surely challenge me to regain his power. With the Allspark so close within our grasp, we cannot afford a power struggle. You must ensure that Megatron can never be revived. You want me to kill the founder of the Decepticon army? In his sleep? I want you to ensure the future of the Decepticons. Do not fail me. I feel like this part of the game, this cutscene specifically, cements Starscream's place as the villain of the game. Up to this point, it's been relatively unclear who the villain truly is, since you're all alien killing machines. The desperation in Starscream's voice when he tells you that he cannot afford for Megatron to live again is definitely noticeable. The voice acting cast of this game really ran with what they were given, and for the most part, they were the ones pouring so much life into the characters, considering the characters are 2007 low poly Nintendo DS models. This scene also hammers the point home that Starscream is the villain considering it's the first time he shows himself in the entire game. Up until now he's just been a voice on your intercom giving you orders and telling you where to go and what to do. However once he realizes that his ultimate victory could be jeopardized he finally shows himself to you. Anyways after this comes another brawl mission where once again you get to blow shit up and plant bombs along the Hoover Dam. Not much else to say about it. The mission ends with you bringing Barricade, one of the army tanks, so that you can interrogate the humans inside. So you interrogate the humans inside the tank and then you your character finally makes his choice between killing Megatron and ensuring Starscream's plans to continue leading the Decepticons can go on, or informing the rest of your team about his shady antics. And now to see what info I can find out. Barricade, before you go, there's something I need to tell you. You mean that Starscream wants you to kill Megatron before I can revive him? What? How did you know? Starscream would never go to all this trouble for a missing Decepticon. Megatron is the only one who could remove him from power. Well, there is more. Starscream says the Allspark is here on Earth. What? You better start talking, and fast! Starscream said that the only reason that Megatron would be here is because he was chasing the Allspark. Lugnuts! 
I knew Starscream's been lying to us all this time. But I had no idea about the Allspark. Sounds to me like Starscream wanted to keep it for himself. Actually, he said he wanted to secure the Allspark before anyone else, to prevent everyone from fighting over it. Yeah, right. So he can ensure that no one can challenge him. Not even Megatron. It would be really nice to see a remake of this game, but with an actual option to choose sides. A HD remake of this game would be enough for me, to be honest, but an option to choose sides and have a branching storyline would really take this game to the next level. Of course, I understand why they couldn't do this back in 2007 on the Nintendo DS hardware, but now that's a different story. Anyway, next you blow up a Sector 7 camp as Barricade, where you also find out that they've made peace with Bumblebee and the Autobots. They send a few generic Autobot warriors after you, and once you make quick work of them, you can finish destroying the base and complete the mission. You tell Black Owl that you've found a way inside the Hoover Dam base from the information you just gathered and that you need his help getting inside. He drops you in through an opening on the roof and what follows is a sort of missed opportunity for a stealth mission. I'm not gonna lie, you're tossed with finding a control room inside the secret Sector 7 base which is crawling with Sector 7 military units. You'd think, considering that Barricade can transform into a cop car, that he'd be able to stealth his way around the base. However, I suppose the game programmers didn't think of that one. You can can drive around the base if you want, but everyone will know you're not actually one of them and they'll shoot at you regardless. It's far more fun to take this mission head on rather than try to speed all the way through it as if your grandma and dog's lives combined depend on it. Anyway, once you get to the control panel, you finally access Megatron's precise location. You're then tasked with the job of protecting Megatron while Barricade thaws his icy tomb. This mission can be pretty tricky and towards the end it can actually get pretty tense. Literally all you have to do is kill a bunch of Autobots and military units that crowd into Megatron's holding cell trying to kill him before you can unfreeze him. However, that's the catch. They are all trying to kill him. You can find yourself overwhelmed in a room full of tanks and machine gun mounted trucks pelting Megatron from all directions and they shred his health at an insane speed. For the leader of an evil alien army, he sure got some pussy armor. Anyway, once you wait out the time limit, Megatron breaks free and reunites with your team. So now you take control of Blackout in what is possibly the most stressful mission in the entire game. You have to blow up every single armored truck marked on your minimap until one of them shits out Megatron's weapon chip. However, if a single truck escapes before you find the Chip, even if it wasn't carrying it, you fail the mission. I've played through this game more times than I've taken breaths over the years, and I'm pretty sure this is just down to RNG and not connected to a specific truck. So depending on how the game's feeling, you could just stomp the first truck you see and get the chip, or spend five minutes flying around like a fucking dickbag until one of the convoy trucks escapes. Once you finally manage to get the chip, you bring it back to Megatron and he gives a long speech to you and your team. My Decepticon brothers. We are united once again. Today we dine on the sparks of all Autobots. Today I will reduce Starscream to a pile of scrap metal. Today we recover the Allspark and show the universe what it means to be a Decepticon! The Autobots took the Allspark. Bumblebee's got it and he's heading to Tranquility. What? Lord Megatron, we already have a contingency plan in place. We have planted explosives all along the dam. Its destruction will result in many casualties of the planet's inhabitants. The Autobots will be so preoccupied with saving them that they won't be able to resist us when we go to reclaim the Allspark. Mm, acceptable. I suppose I won't have to kill you for your failure. Decepticons, to the city! So you all head back to the city to chase after Bumblebee and reclaim the Allspark, except this asshole shoots Megatron out of the sky and starts a boss battle. This is the first time in the entire game that you get to play as Megatron. Unfortunately, they programmed him to be ridiculously broken beyond belief, so for this mission they not only nerfed him by disabling your ability to transform, well, they didn't disable it, but if you try and do it, then you get missiles vomited all over you from seemingly out of nowhere. But they also make Jazz himself ridiculously powerful. As a kid, this used to be the boss I'd struggle with the most out of any in the entire game. The final boss was nothing compared to this. This little jumping jack sack of bullsack shit literally never stops jumping around, making melee attacks almost useless against him. This is a shame because Megatron's melee attacks are incredibly strong, so it sucks you can't use them here. The best way to beat him is to use your light weapon. Everyone's light weapons have 
aimbot, whereas your heavy weapons don't. The fact that he's jumping around like he's got a flea infestation in his prostate gland makes your heavy weapons useless. You'll miss almost every shot unless you time it properly, but even then you won't be able to shoot him as often as you need to be dealing the equal damage as he's dealing to you. The best way to beat him is to just jump around like a madman and hold down the Y button. If you need health at any point, there's a small hill you can climb that he doesn't seem to be able to reach you on. So Megatron can take a quick Gatorade break and regain his health before jumping back down to this trampoline park of a boss fight. I'd like to make it pretty clear that this boss fight is still really fun. It's challenging, I'll tell you that much, but it's in no way a bad fight. Everything that would give you the edge in this fight is stripped away from you, and it makes sense since canonically Megatron just woke up five minutes ago from a million year coma. You have to adapt and use raw skill to beat this boss, without access to any of Megatron's broken heavy weapons or jet form that he gets later in the game. And for that, this boss is definitely high tier. Anyway, you kill Jazz and return to the city with your team, where you're immediately met with another boss fight, this time your brawl fighting Ironhide. It's a pretty easy boss once you know how it works, just wait for him to jump at you and while he's recovering from his attack, you melee the shit out of him like you're a British football fan coming home after a loss on game night. As a kid, I never knew how this worked, I never knew this was actually how the boss fight worked, so I'd figure out that you could get Ironhide stuck behind a building and just shoot grenades at him from over the roof. This method takes like 20 minutes compared compared to the intended way of beating him, which takes about two, but as a kid this made me feel like Superman beating him this way. So you kill Ironhide, and that's the last we see of Brawl in the entire game. I'm not sure why he doesn't show up again, but that's his final mission in the game until you unlock Free Roam in the post game. After that mission, you take control of Starscream chasing down Bumblebee, who has the Allspark. This is where the game gets tense. You know you're in the end game now. This is what the story has been building up to this entire time. Anyway, you chase Bumblebee through a junkyard and finally into a Tesco parking lot with a neighboring blockbuster video, or at least that's what it looks like to me. Here you have a quick boss battle with Bumblebee, and I've got to say, I think Starscream is one of the most fun characters to play in this game. He's so unbelievably broken that I'm not surprised you only get this one mission to play as him. His primary weapon shreds health like no other in the game, and the rate of fire is so high you'd think this man is playing life without a refractory period. His heavy weapon missiles are broken too, and in the multiplayer of this game he's arguably the best character because of this alone. His jet speed is insane, allowing you to quickly strafe around enemies if you need to dodge or take a breather. His jet missiles also travel quicker than the speed of sperm, so you can just sit as an eye in the sky and rain down hellfire if you need to. Like missile hellfire, I mean. I, I don't think Starscream has the ability to... to... sperm. You, you know what I mean. His one weakness is his jump. He jumps about two inches off of the ground at maximum altitude. My guy skipped every leg day in history, but he can literally transform into a jet, so the jump isn't really much of a setback. So you kill Bumblebee and take the Allspark from him, but you're quickly interrupted by Blackout. Drop it, Starscream. The Allspark goes to Lord Megatron. True leader of the Decept- oh! It's over, Starscream. Megatron's in charge again. Give me the Allspark, and I'm sure we can work something out. Fool! I've ruled the Decepticon Empire for countless millennia. I possess the Allspark. Something. Megatron was never able to accomplish. I am the true leader of the Decepticons. Kneel before me, or you will be executed for treason. Kneel before you? Your own protege turned on you. What makes you think any of us are going to take orders from a bureaucrat like you? Execution it is then. Sentence to be carried out immediately. This boss fight is one of the best in the game for me, just because of the weight and consequence it carries. You play as your former mentor fighting your new mentor and brother in arms. The boss itself is actually pretty challenging too. Barricade does this weird thing where he transforms and charges at you head on, and if it hits, it takes like a quarter of your life bar. He also gets the jazz treatment, wherein his weapon damage has been heavily buffed. The trick is to keep him at a distance. If you melee him, he'll drive into you and pepper you with grenades, which will kill you near instantly. If you keep him at a decent range and try to stay away from his light weapon, you should be fine. There's a bunch of objects he can get stuck on, so I always try and get him hooked on one of those while I shower him with missiles. In total, there are three barricade boss fights. There's this one, and there's two in the Autobots variant of this same game. But this is by far the most challenging one, and it's fitting that it is. So once you pepper him long enough, you beat him and Starscream flies away with the Allspark. Your character runs in all too late to find Barricade in a mess on the ground. Now, you see what it is to be a Decepticon. Uh, uh. 
Barricade's death isn't one I saw coming back when I first played as a kid, and I suppose that's because I don't think I was used to games killing off the protagonist with such a trigger finger. Up to this point in games, you'd be lucky to have one or two protagonists killed off at most, but here in the final phase of the game, we've seen so many main characters die in the span of just a few levels. I don't know if I'd count Jazz or Ironhide since you only see them for their respective boss fights and then never again, but Bumblebee, Barricade, and Blackout all die in the same level here. I know Bumblebee is technically an antagonist in this game, but I digress. I also enjoy how Starscream is actually playable here in a main story mission. In the Autobots version of the game, you don't play as anyone that would be considered an antagonist. However, in the Decepticons one, you play as Starscream for this one massacre of a mission, and it feels so kick-ass to be able to play the main villain of the game and kill off your team. In fact, now that I think about it, it's a pretty heavy way to kill off your team. Sure, Brawl survived, but Barricade and Blackout have been helping you since the get-go. They've been your teammates from the start, from the beginning, and the game forces you to kill them off yourself, even if you do play as Starscream while you do it. They could have pretty easily left this mission out altogether and kept Starscream as an NPC villain, but having him in and making him playable really puts this game a notch above the Autobots version for me. They don't have you doing some pussy task either, no no, they have you massacre your team and for me that makes it one of the best missions in the game. Anyway, right after this you take control of your character once again, hunting Starscream down to a junkyard in the city where he scolds you on your failure to keep Megatron from being revived. So Megatron has been revived. This means you have either failed me or betrayed me. Neither option bodes well for you. Barricade was right. You are a coward. Megatron conquers to obtain power. You just steal it. You are such a disappointment, my protege. So Starscream has you fight 25 spider drones, and once you kill them all, he flies away and you have to hunt him down to do it again. I've tried hitting him while he's just standing there on top of the tent, but he's fully invulnerable. I guess the power of the Allspark makes him impossible to hit. Once you finish that, you chase him down one final time before you meet him in a small neighborhood in one of the corners of the map. Upon arriving, you're both ambushed by an Autobot squadron, to which Starscream flies away and you're left to fend for yourself. Once you kill all of the Autobots, you contact Megatron, telling him you lost Starscream and the Allspark. Lug nuts! I've lost him! Lord Megatron, Starscream gave me the slip. He was too fast for me. What makes you think I'm interested in your excuses? I will find that traitor myself! Hello, brother. Stay out of my way, Optimus. You'll never retrieve the Allspark before I do. I'm not here for the Allspark. I am here for you, Megatron. Ha 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 laughable! As soon as I take the Allspark from that traitor Starscream, no Autobot will be left alive! You don't have the Allspark now. I don't need it to defeat you. It is over, Prime. Never. So be it, brother. Let our war begin again. On Earth! Now here it is, the big fight between the two faction leaders. We have Optimus Prime versus Megatron, a classic showdown. Although, in terms of the game's story, this fight actually doesn't have much relevance. In fact, Optimus doesn't have much story presence at all. This is the first time we hear him speak or see him in actual gameplay besides his arrival scene. He has as much story presence as someone like Jazz did. Obviously everyone knows who he is because he's Optimus fucking Prime, but the fight between him and Megatron here doesn't have much build up besides the fact that these two fight in almost all Transformers media that exists ever. The Starscream and Barricade fight had actual build up and the two characters had shown distaste for each other throughout the story, so seeing them finally clash was super interesting. Here it's cool to see, but it doesn't carry any story weight whatsoever. Either way, this boss fight is a ton of fun. There's no gimmick to it like there was with Jazz or Ironhide, this is just a straight downtown shootout. Optimus' weapons pack a punch, his missiles specifically, so try and dodge those and he's a breeze. You could just run circles around him and spam your heavy weapons, but that would take a long time and it just doesn't seem to be as effective as playing this boss fight with mix-up strategies. Optimus stalls when you get close to him, almost as if the AI has to register the fact that you've just leaned in for a fucking kiss or something. Mixing up gunplay with melee strikes in this this fight will make it far easier for you. And if you can try to lob a truck at him here and there, they shred his health pretty bad. There's actually a glitch for this boss fight where you take control of your custom character instead of Megatron. This happens in both the Decepticons and Autobots version of the game, and I don't think anyone really knows why. It usually occurs when you've kept the same vehicle form on your character for at least four consecutive story missions without changing it. You'll know the glitch is in effect if your custom character starts showing up with the default paint job and not the custom one you selected. If this happens,
happens, then for both the final boss and the Optimus Prime fight, you'll have access to your custom character. This is really beneficial once you're max level, as once you're max level, your custom character becomes the strongest character on the roster, meaning you can shred both Prime and the final boss with little to no effort whatsoever. Anyways, you eventually pepper Optimus with enough missiles and left hooks to the fucking face, and you kill him. Once you've killed Optimus, Megatron gives a small speech over his dead body. With your death, no one will stop me! I will conquer the universe! I, for one, would like to test that theory. If you truly wish to rule the Decepticons, then follow me to battle! Will you follow me to victory? Yes, Lord Megatron. You know, before I continue with the story progression, I want to reiterate how cool it is that this game focuses as much as possible on inner Decepticon conflict. The whole story revolves around the conflict between Starscream and the Decepticons, and they don't distract from that by shoving the Autobots into a story that they don't naturally have a large role in just because that's how it arbitrarily should be. They treat Optimus Prime, arguably the main character of this franchise, as a plot device. Optimus Prime is a plot device. He's merely an obstacle that's briefly mentioned by the main cast that you as a team try to actively avoid. It makes sense really, since you and your team are portrayed as a mid-tier team. You're just a standard group of Decepticons working under the higher-ups like Megatron and Starscream. It makes sense that you don't really interact with Optimus since Barricade clearly stated earlier in the story that you don't want to mess with him. He's frankly too strong for your own good, and he most likely will fucking obliterate you. For that reason, fighting him as Megatron makes the most sense, considering he's the only person besides Starscream who would be able to hold a candle to his skill in the game's canon. I speak only for this version of the game, however, because in the Autobots version, the entire Decepticon team actively tries to fight him and gets dropped every single time. Optimus straight up crushes Brawl to death with tanks, and he tosses Barricade around like a ragdoll in that game, so I like to see him distant in this game. It builds him up as a threat, a force to be reckoned with, someone your team will go great lengths to avoid because you acknowledge you'd be unfairly matched. It's a nice touch. Here we go, the final boss of the game. This boss has two phases, so we'll run through the first phase first and the second one second. I failed my math GCSE, but I can count. This first phase has you confront Starscream with your custom character. He tells you to prepare for your elimination and the battle begins. He's totally invincible by the way, and he takes no damage from your attacks here, so shooting or punching him is completely useless. Instead, what you want to do is duck and weave your way behind him and donkey punch him in the back of the head. You do this about three times and he'll drop the all spark. You then want to grab it and slap him with it. You have to do this part relatively quick because if you don't, he'll start peppering you with an infinite stream of missiles that will shred your health down. And you'll have to restart the level. Anyway, you hit him with the all spark, which knocks you both to the ground. Your character is completely knocked out, but Starscream gets up and flies away, trying to retreat. Megatron swoops in from out of nowhere, and you switch characters on the fly. Now it is really the final boss. Megatron versus Starscream. Oh yeah. All right, let's go. The stakes are high. The battle for leadership of the faction is in full swing. This is a similar fight to the Bumblebee fight we had earlier in the game. Earlier in the game, if you remember, you follow Bumblebee to different locations as Barricade and fight him at each one respectively. Here you do the same thing, except you're both jets, so you're just flying the whole time. Starscream has a ton of health, so he'll eat your gunfire like nobody's business. However, he rarely actually moves, so he's not that difficult. He prefers to remain static and pivot on the spot rather than to run around shooting at you gung-ho. Anyway, you take all his health down, beat him once and for all, and then you get the final cutscene. of the one unforgivable crime, failure! I won't be the last Megatron. Someone will always be there to challenge your leadership. Maybe, but they will suffer the same fate as you. <laughs> Victory is mine! All shall fear the might of Megatron! We did it, Lord Megatron. But... Barricade... and the others... If they were truly Decepticons, they would have survived. Weakness is a rust 
It must be stripped away. Just like you. What? But... I helped save you. Yes, but you are heavily damaged. But... could be... repaired. A waste of resources. The weak only serve to benefit the strong. Man, I won't lie, that's a heavy ending for a DS game. The whole game, you and your team are fighting to revive the great leader of the Decepticons, Megatron. The whole time, your every move revolves around rescuing him and stopping anyone who opposes him. Your team has undying loyalty to him, even in his cryo-frozen state. However, at the end of the game, he's the one who betrays you. Not only does he refuse to repair you, calling you a waste of resource and killing you on the spot, but he also has the goal to effectively call your entire team a fraud before flying off into the night with your spark. I like this ending a lot, and while I would have liked an ending where you get to serve at Megatron's side as his right-hand man after proving your undying loyalty, I think I prefer this darker ending. This ending reminds you that you've just been playing as a normal Decepticon this whole time. Your character isn't significant in the grand scheme of things, and you were just doing your duty as a Decepticon. It puts you in the field as a regular soldier, but in a fun and creative way. It pits you with a fellow Decepticon squadron on Earth hunting for Megatron's signal, but in the grand scheme of things, you're just pawns in the higher-ups game. The whole time you're being played by Starscream in his attempt to gain ultimate power in some sort of Thanos Infinity Gauntlet type move, and then at the end of the game, when you finally thwart Starscream's plans, you're put in your place by the big bad himself. Barricade's words from earlier in the game ring truer than ever about knowing what it is to be a Decepticon. Being a Decepticon to Barricade was seeing his duty out to the end, fighting for the true Decepticon cause and serving Lord Megatron no matter what orders he gave out, and under no circumstance did he want to defect to Starscream's reign, as he didn't see that as the true Decepticon way. Starscream was such an amazing main villain too, I mean he was a liar and a schemer and he threatened your character to never seek out Megatron. And when you do that and find out the truth, what does he do? He betrays you and he wipes out your friends and seizes the Allspark for himself, revealing that he was the true main antagonist of the game. Now that is Starscream done right, and I really think the movie should have taken some inspiration from their own video games. I'm not saying he was portrayed badly in the movies, I just think he was portrayed so well in this game that it makes the movie one kind of pale in comparison. By the end of the game, the only one truly left standing is Megatron. You've achieved your goal of resurrecting him and providing him the power of the Allspark. You've fulfilled your duty, and as Barricade said in his dying words, Now, you see what it is to be a Decepticon. Compared to the Autobots version of the game, this one really blows it out of the water in my opinion. The Autobots game, while good, is very bland in comparison. When comparing the campaign modes of both, the Autobots one is just loosely following the 2007 movie with some slight changes here and there to fit the gameplay better. However, with the Decepticons version, the devs wrote their own story entirely. It still contains elements from the movie's story, such as the Allspark, Bumblebee's capture, Megatron killing Jazz, and the whole barricade cop chase scene, and much more. However, despite having the same setups as the movie, it does its own thing with it entirely and I think overall manages to be a far better written story than any of the movies were. I want to talk a little bit about gameplay here as I've spent most of my time so far talking about the story exclusively. The gameplay for a DS game is incredibly smooth. The camera is weird, but that's just the nature of having shoulder buttons as your main camera control. Mario 64 on the DS suffered the same issue. Transforming is controlled by a button on the touchscreen, which is just to the left of the four face buttons, making it incredibly easy to transform on the fly. You can also transform faster if you turbo boost the second you press the transform button. This skips the transforming animation entirely and immediately puts you into your vehicle mode at top speed. The melee feels incredibly responsive and I never have an issue with aiming my melee weapons. The shooting is also really smooth and once you get it down you can have some seriously intense games in the multiplayer mode. Oh yeah, the multiplayer mode. Uh, did I not mention the multiplayer mode? The multiplayer mode is one of the best parts of the game that I just never got to experience properly. I used to play with my grandparents since they were the only ones who wanted to play it with me. I have a ton of great memories of my grandpa trying to figure out how to fire off a missile while I was blasting him with rockets from above, and out of nowhere he'd figure it out, shooting at me and knocking me down into the abyss below on the Cybertron map. The whole thing was a ton of fun, and I kind of wish someone would remake the game as a sort of fan project with better controls so that people could play it online again. You could play as every character in the game, depending on which version you had, and you could choose between a variety of stages, including a multiplayer exclusive Cybertron stage. 
you could have up to four players in either a team battle or a free for all, and you could either do a deathmatch or all spark sports. Yeah, all spark sports, that was basically football, but you're giant robots in space and you can shoot at each other, it was weird. The aim of the game was to carry the all spark into your team's net to hit the score limit. Heavy weapons would knock your opponent to the ground for a short time, forcing them to drop the all spark, so this was a good way to stop them from scoring if they were too close to their net. It was also viable if you were a faster character, to drive into their ass as they were running away from you with it, forcing them to drop it and giving you the quick edge so that you could swoop it up off the ground. I always preferred death matches though, those were the most fun. There's definitely a tier list that I could put together, but I feel like that's for a separate video. I'd happily do it as this game is a huge part of my childhood and something I'm really passionate about, but I'll do it separately and I'd want to make sure you guys want to see it. Whenever I was playing death matches, I'd always pick someone like Megatron or Starscream, the characters who could fly. They always had the edge over everyone else because of their speed in the air and also just their raw strength. However, if you were skilled enough with a ground vehicle character and you knew what you were doing, you could trap them in a missile and melee combo. So, spoiler alert for potential tier list, those two guys are right at the top. The game also had a battle for the all spark mode, where you'd compete in challenges online to get the highest score for your faction. This game went really above and beyond with all of its modes and such. The amount of content back then when its servers were still up was seriously crazy. Battle for the all spark gave people some pretty cool rewards too, such as exclusive vehicles and cool cheat codes that you could apply in the options menu. The most notable thing that people are disappointed about is that now the servers are offline, the jet vehicle modes for your custom characters are now fully unobtainable without using a hacked version of the game. The jet mode for the Decepticons game was a G1 Starscream skin and it looked pretty badass. If your character was fully leveled up and you slap this vehicle mode on him, you're sitting at the top of the pyramid with the strongest character in these games. G1 Starscream, from what I've played of him, is the most powerful character across both games. It's a shame that he's unobtainable without using some sort of cheat or hack system now, but you can look up gameplay of him online, you can see for yourself that he's basically a broken version of Starscream. If Starscream wasn't already broken enough. Look, I could talk forever about this game, and given enough time, I could probably think of more to say about it for at least an hour. However, I feel like I've explained enough to you guys about the best DS game you've never played. An open world third person shooter with well written characters, a compelling story about choosing your loyalty within a crumbling evil faction, tight controls, and a whole roster of vehicles to use and characters to play as, each with individual playstyles, with an enticing multiplayer mode and a wanted level system that encourages you to smash the shit out of the city, boss fights that have real difficulty and that feel like boss fights, alongside an incredible voice cast featuring some pretty huge names in the voice acting world, this game truly shows you what it is to be a Decepticon.